Menneskets udviklingshistorie. Hvem vi er, og hvor vi kommer fra. Hvad er det, der gør os til mennesker? Hvad er det, der giver os den evne til at tænke over fortiden og spekulere på fremtiden? Hvem vi er som en art er en fantastisk historie, som går mere end 4 millioner år tilbage til Afrika. På det kontinent har mange forskere gjort opdagelser af alle de beviser, som der findes for vores historie. Og i, den sidste, i løbet af det sidste år 10 er nogle af de største og vigtigste fund gjort af professor Lee Berger og hans hold i Sydafrika. Lee Berger er en amerikansk professor i menneskelig evolution ved Witwatersrand Universitet i Johannesburg i Sydafrika. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, why don't you begin by giving us a little bit of a background and uh, on our story and uh, so that we all know where your discoveries sort of fit into that story. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So I, I've been in Africa for uh, the past 27 years, first in East Africa, then in South Africa. And I've been engaged in this search for understanding human origins and particularly looking for fossil evidence of that. Uh, I spent uh, my first 17 years in Southern Africa Uh, working at various sites and finding very little, just little bits and pieces. This, mm -hmm. is, this is a field of scraps. It's a field where arguably uh, you have less of a chance of, of making a discovery, and this some people say less than 1% chance in your entire career of making even a discovery of a single piece. It's a field that uh, up until recently it had uh, more scientists than objects that we studied, so it's a hard field. For 17 years. I spent my time at a variety of sites making just some little tiny discoveries across Southern Africa and in other parts of the world. Uh, in 2008, though, uh, my then nine-year-old son actually discovered the first piece of what would lead to a spectacular discovery, discovery of Australopithecus sediba, a new species of, of primitive human that was, came from a site that I would call Malapa, which means my home uh, in the Sutu language. And that would become one of the richest fossil hominid sites uh, ever discovered in history. And I, I really thought that was my lottery. Okay. You know, I won a lottery. Today. Right, right. Um, we built a huge scientific team around that, uh, more than 100 scientists, published a lot of scientific research. Um, then in 2013, lightning struck again. Mm -hmm. One of my exploration team made up of former students and, uh, and amateurs discovered in a deep underground chamber, another fossil hominid discovery that would turn out to be the richest ever discovered in, in history on the continent of Africa. Uh, more than 15 individuals, uh, thousands and thousands of remains. We've left many of them down in chamber of again a new species, but this time in our genus, the genus Homo that we would call Homo naledi, announced uh, in September of 2015. It's been a it's been a great time to be right. a paleoanthropologist, and now I guess we can say that uh, uh, there are more fossils than there are scientists we study. <laughs> great, <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, and for the Homo naledi, I would very much like you to tell me that that story because it it's an amazing story. It, as I understand it, it begins by two climbers coming home to you with uh, right, so some photos or something. So. It, it actually, it, it often sounds in the way that it's portrayed in the media as if it were an accident. It, <laughs> it wasn't an accident. Um, I had engaged a former student of mine, Pedro Boshoff, uh, to actually do underground exploration based on a map mm. I created back in 2008 of some 700 potential localities. Ah. That's actually how I discovered Sediba. So I had this map mm. waiting there. And so I asked him to go underground. He realized that he wasn't perhaps physiologically appropriate to get into <laughs> okay. some of these smaller spaces. And so we engaged two amateur cavers, um, mm. Rick Hunter and Steve Tucker. And uh, they began using this map, exploring for these potential discoveries in these underground environments. And they were extreme. Mm -hmm. You can imagine most of them, they're not these gigantic cave systems. They're, they're narrow passageways and slots okay. that actually people have to, to crawl through in this region. They're, they're housed in a very ancient rock, a dolomitic limestone that is about uh, 2.9 billion years old. Oh. And the cracks inside of it form more recently. And in September of 2013, they went off of a map in a very well-explored cave, went down this chute. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that had a 12-meter uh, uh, 
sort of descent mm -hmm. through about 17 and a half centimeters wide. That they had to we get had through. To go down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you and I shall never go in there. At the bottom of that, they found a small chamber that they brought photographs back to me. And when I first saw the images on a laptop of those uh, photographs, I was blown away. I thought I would never see something like this in my career. There on the very first image was a jawbone that I could clearly see was a primitive human relative. I could see by the shape of the teeth, by the form of the teeth, by its size. Uh, and you shouldn't see things like that. You know, these are, <laughs> it, they just aren't lying there on the ground, particularly in a cave several hundred meters back into a system like that. The next picture showed more material. Uh, after that, I could see a skull there sitting in dirt. Wow. Um, I organized an expedition very quickly. Uh, we went out into the field uh, literally within a month of that. I put a 60-person expedition in, and very quickly, wow. within a couple of days, we realized that this was not just the discovery of a skeleton down inside of a deep chamber. We had perhaps uh, the richest fossil hominid site ever discovered in history. Uh, and the discoveries have kept coming. Uh, it would turn out, as I said, to be a completely uh, new type of hominid, uh, a member of our genus, uh, but very primitive in our genus. So something right at the base of where we branch off mm -hmm. from perhaps the Australopithecines, um, but different than anything else we'd found before, different than Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis or even primitive Homo erectus. So it's telling us there's more out there. Uh, and why is it that you're saying it's it's uh, right at the base? What what is that? Is we, that the small brain? Or? It, it's a combination of features. Mm -hmm. So it has things that that are primitive within our lineage. It's got an extremely small brain, as you say. It's got primitive dentition. The teeth are proportioned in a way that only earlier hominids have it, not later hominids. The actual form of the teeth is, are actually quite primitive. It's got curved fingers. It's got shoulders that are like mm -hmm. an ape. Uh -huh. And just go back to the fingers. The fingers are so curved, they're as curved as the most primitive members of our lineage. Uh, so to, to grab? Probably for climbing, but we don't know what they're climbing. Uh -huh. The shoulders indicate they're climbing as well. They're ape-like. Uh -huh. But then it's got a pelvis, which is uh, like those of Lucy, the famous Lucy fossil. So what you would see normally in a hominid that's three million or more uh, years in age, uh, but not with that kind of head shape. They wouldn't have that advanced head. The legs are long and the feet are human-like. And so it's this, it's this mix of features. Mm -hmm. And all of those together tell us that it must come from somewhere near the root mm -hmm. of where our experiment began. But it doesn't fit the story we were telling earlier. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, I've said that the, the idea of, of being able to just easily tell how human origins happened that's gone now. Yeah. It's complex. <laughs> right, right. So, so if, if we were back there at that time, what, what sort of homo or ape or what, what sort of animal would we see or human? So, you mm. know, I, I often, as you <laughs> might imagine, sit and try and, and see mm. homo naledi. You know, what would, it, what would it look like if you, if you encountered them? Um, firstly, you know, at a distance, because we only have a mirror of one bipedal ape to look at ourselves living mm -hmm. at this particular time, you'd probably think if you saw a group of them on the horizon in Africa, it, it was a group of humans. But small, yeah, though. Yeah, a little bit. Oh. You know, I mean, some of them are close to 1.5 meters, so it's okay. not that small. Mm -hmm. you had plenty of humans are, are that high. As they got closer, though, you'd very quickly realize that that's not a human looking mm -hmm. at you. You would see this, this, this skinny but powerful bodies. You would see these narrow shoulders. We're used to seeing humans with these broad shoulders, which we have for running and, and, and long-distance walking, the way we breathe. This would have a very narrow, ape-like shoulder, and that would look strange. Mm. But what would strike you probably most, even, though, even beyond the sort of curved hands that you would see, would be this tiny sort of almost pin-like head. <laughs> you know, it, Homo naledi has a brain the size of a largest orange. Mm, right. You know, something like a third to a quarter the size of a human brain. But it's put on a relatively tallish body, 1.5 meters. So you would look at this and go, that's, that's not human. Now, how would they behave when they saw us? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I bet they'd probably be pretty scary to encounter <laughs> if you were alone mm -hmm. uh, and weren't with another group of, of, of humans. So... 
So, other than that, though, we know almost nothing about them. Homo naledi is perhaps one of the best-known hominids ever discovered because we have so much. Fifteen individuals, thousands of remains, every part of the body practically uh, in multiple individuals, yet we have this singular context. So we don't know what they're doing out in the world at this stage. We will in the future. Mm -hmm. We'll find them now that we know they exist. But until that moment, they were invisible to us. Do, do you think they had some culture? Like, do you have, have you found stone tools, for example? Well, we haven't in that chamber. Mm -hmm. And we haven't been able to associate culture with them outside of that because it's a, a singular occurrence at this stage. But their hands speak to tool use. They have a long thumb, they have shortened fingers, they have prehensality, the ability to mm -hmm. do this almost better than humans do, in fact. Um, so that speaks to tool use. They have small dentition. That speaks to the pre-processing mm, of tools. Because right. if, you're, if you're doing your processing in your mouth, you need big, strong teeth. They have little teeth like we do. Not shaped like ours, but, but close. And, and so that speaks to the potential for pre-processing. Mm -hmm. If the sort of ideas, the hypotheses we have now about why those things are, are true. Um, so everything about Homo Leti says probably a competent tool maker that's complex. It's got a very sophisticated looking brain, mm -hmm. a brain that in many ways looks like a small human brain, but different in some ways. And so it speaks to a complex, uh, potentially cultural hominid. But we don't have that situation outside yet, but we'll find it. So what, is also, what this also sort of sounds like is that, that back in time, well, it's really only in recent times that there was just one human around. And back in time, there have been maybe not just Homo, but uh, Australopithecines alongside Homos and different Homos and different. So it's been a, a landscape full of these upright walking <laughs> I, I humans think, are human-like apes. I, I think the recent discoveries, not only the ones we're making, but all over, are saying that that this idea that we've been alone on this planet is just not true, and that we've been masters of the evolution in a very simple way is not true. That any one time in the past there were multiple experiments going on. And and what's, what's important about that, and why I mentioned genetics um, as being important, is is that those can have real influence on us. We used to think species were immutable, that they were, once a species formed, it was separate from all others. Now we know they can come back together. And that tells us that all of these discoveries have potentially tremendous importance in understanding our story, you know, the sort of journey of us. And, and also that, for example, the old idea that once you got a big brain you would become a human or once you develop tools you become human that that doesn't necessarily or that doesn't have to be so at all that you can develop tools and then still go extinct and not be a human <laughs> yeah. that's right and i think that's really important i mean I, I think that you know since humans have been examining themselves they've been almost you know struggling with a way to make sure that we're separate from nature. Every, yeah. <laughs> every religious document, it starts with why we're different. Um, it, it, when, when Linnaeus was classifying all lot of species on this planet, for humans, he said, know thyself. Mm -hmm. That's not very useful, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's this, this need to separate. So what we've seen in paleoanthropology and other fields is a, an eroding of that difference, that separation of humans from nature. You know, first in the Victorian era, it was easy. You know, it was easy to know how we were different. There was man and there were animals. And then we <laughs> found inconvenient fossils. And then there was women. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And then we found inconvenient fossils. And that said that there wasn't so much separation between, for example, apes, our closest relatives, and humans. Darwin recognized that in the 1860s, as early as then. Then, you know, Jane Goodall ruined everything when she <laughs> saw chimpanzees manufacturing and using tools. And Lewis Leakey said profoundly at the time, we're going to have to uh, redefine what it means to be human. And then we started losing other things. We saw the complexity of birds and the way they can adorn nests and decorate and and do things. Then we found out animals mourn. But now we're seeing things like Homo naledi, these complex things that aren't human, 
with complex anatomy. They may have even deliberately disposed of their dead in that chamber. And there's not much less that left that separates us from the animal world. And we may not be the inventor of all these special things that we think are uniquely ours. And that's kind of exciting. But, but it also leaves us sort of a little, like, <laughs> I don't know, empty. Uh, we <laughs> want to be special. We, we, we love to look at ourselves and say we're special. I think planet <laughs> Earth would be a much better place right. <laughs> if human beings recognize that, that we're not separate from nature. Mm -hmm. We're just another uh, yet untested experiment uh, in a long history of experimentation on this planet. And I think that uh, humanity could use a little bit more uh, um, humble pie, as they say in America, <laughs> to about their special place in nature. So maybe to uh, round off, I'd like to talk a little bit about the future mm, of the the fossil finds, mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. And this uh, this thing that I've read about South Africa, and that I think is true, but you can correct me, is that about a third of uh, all uh, fossils of Australopithecines, and this is before Homo naledi was actually found in South Africa. So, so I'm thinking there must be something <laughs> very special to that that landscape. What what what, what is that? And I'll, yeah. I'll tell you what is special about the landscape in Southern Africa and why uh, we're finding so many hominids there now. I mean, you were right. Before Sidiba and Naledi, it was about a third, then it went to about 40%. Now it's you know, 60 or 70% of all wow. of them. It's because we're looking there. Mm. It's, not a, it's not a magic place. Okay. It's because there are scientists based there exploring. That's the lesson that I've learned. These two big discoveries and the more that are coming along the way mm -hmm. were discovered in the most explored area on planet Earth for these very objects for 90 years. <laughs> okay. And yet they were right under our nose. The first one, so easy that a nine-year-old could find it. My <laughs> nine-year-old son could actually find it. The second one in a small chamber that other people had been in before and missed it. Um, we need to build a generation of real explorers again. People who are brave enough to go out there into areas that haven't been explored, and areas that have, <laughs> and people say there's nothing left, and make discoveries. Because I truly believe the reason that these discoveries are being made is only because we are there. Mm. And when we move elsewhere, those discoveries will be there too. And I think anyone who would just look at all areas of, of studies like this, all areas of science like this, would see that that is true. Look at what's happening in Egyptology now. Mm. Look what's happening in North American archaeology. Look what's happening in South American archaeology as you find that there weren't just hundreds of pyramids, there are thousands of them. And, and the type of information that technology allows us to actually make discoveries, but it still takes great human exploration in a belief that there's more out there to be found. Mm. Right, okay. So, some more stuff to come. Also from South Africa? Absolutely. <laughs> you won't have to wait very long. Okay. Are you going to give us a little hint? Well, I'll, I'll give you this hint. That when I first made the discovery of, uh, of, of Malop and Sidiba, well, actually Matthew did. Mm -hmm. I followed on that. Everyone said, that's a miracle. Here's the richest new site in the world. It's full of skeletons. It's a miracle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not going to be another one. Mm -hmm. We then made the discovery of Naledi. And everyone said, oh, maybe it isn't a miracle. I can tell you it's not. <laughs> you just have to keep exploring. We've made big discoveries. Okay. Well, look forward to seeing them and hearing more about it. Great. Now I look forward to sharing it. With Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Great. <laughs>